Okay, so let's dive into it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Urban Legends 2. Hope I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's been 21 years, right? That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, depressing in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Talking Pictures. My name is Christian Gensel. I am a filmmaker and film journalist from Salzburg, Austria. Talking Pictures is a podcast series in which I talk to the people who made some of my favorite movies. For today's episode, I had the honor and pleasure of talking to John Ottman, best known as the editor and composer of several X-Men films, X-Men 2, Days of Future Past, and Apocalypse, and of other Brian Singer movies like The Usual Suspects, Valkyrie, and Superman Returns. In 2019, he won an Academy Award for editing the Queen biopic Bohemian Rhapsody. He's also scored numerous other well-known films like The Nice Guys, House of Wax, Gothica, Unknown, and Nonstop. Our conversation, however, revolves around John's feature film debut as a director, Urban Legends Final Cut from 2000, the sequel to Jamie Blanks' successful needle slasher film Urban Legend. Where the original film focused on killings inspired by urban legends, John's sequel was set in a film school where the students are murdered because of their connection to a certain movie. So the film features numerous creative sequences which playfully comment on the mechanisms of making movies and the tropes of horror movies. In our interview, John recalls how he got on board as a director, how the project developed, and how an added scene changed the tone of the movie. He talks about working with a young Eva Mendes, discusses how his own experiences in film school found their way into the film, how he ended up editing the movie himself, and much more. John also recalls how he missed out on the very first X-Men movie because of his commitment to Urban Legends Final Cut, and he discusses a new project currently in development with him as a director. The interview with John Artman was conducted in connection with our German language podcast Lichtspielplatz. So if you speak German, please visit www.lichtspielplatz.at and check out episode number 51, which features an in-depth discussion of the first two Urban Legend movies. Also, make sure to listen to Talking Pictures episode number 17, in which I talk to the director of the original film, Jamie Blanks. If you enjoy my conversation with John Ottman, please visit www.talkingpicturespodcast.com to check out our other interviews and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So without any further ado, here is Talking Pictures with John Ottman. So you're mainly known uh, and very well known as an editor and as a composer, and Urban Legends 2 remains so far your only... Um, feature film as a director so how did that come about right. well you know it's 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 you know in life things happen the way you never expect and um sometimes if you forget what path you're on and then you're suddenly given the reward of the path that that, that, that you hoped would your path you, that you hoped your path would reach because um i you know went to film school to be a director that was my my goal and then i got um not sidetracked but in a way sidetracked to um, you know, edit and compose uh, for for Brian Singer, and that just basically consumed my time. And we did a film for uh, for a company called uh, Phoenix Pictures, a subsidiary of Sony Pictures, mm -hmm. and they kind of got a, a bird's eye view, uh, or I should say, a, a fly in the wall view of how Brian Singer really got made. A Brian Singer film actually got made, <laughs> and uh, they saw what I really did behind the scenes. So. Um, I got a call from Phoenix Pictures uh, one morning and they said, you know, we'd like you to come in and, uh, and talk to us about a project. And I'm like, what are they talking about? You know, like, sir, okay. So I walked in and they said, we want you to direct a feature. And I, and I was just like, oh, um, all right. So uh, it's because they said, you know, we saw what you do on, on these films and you're kind of, uh, you're, you're a director, we think. And so um, I said, well, great. What is it? And they said, well, it's Urban Legends 2. And I was like, oh, <laughs> because I, I always say it was like when your grandmother gives you uh, polka dotted uh, underwear or something for you for Christmas. <laughs> like, oh, thanks, you know, uh, because I mean, it's, it's not that I'm I, again, we'll get into my, my movie. I'm proud of many aspects of it. It's just that I, I didn't feel that a teen horror film for me was necessarily a right move. And then so I told my I told them no. I, I can't do this. Um, I, I thank you so much. And, and so then my, my of all people, my music agent was like, what are you nuts? You know, you, you know, they talked about how, um, 
uh, um, oh my God, the director of Titanic. Um, Jim Cameron. Cameron. I keep wanting, I just wanting to say Cronenberg. Uh, you know, how Cameron started out with Piranha. That would be an interesting you know, film to see Titanic with David <laughs> yeah, Cronenberg. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, but <laughs> just imagining the, this kind of story in the hands of David Cronenberg. That would be awesome, actually. <laughs> um, so they, uh, so um, he said, you know, you, 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 this is how he started out. And I go, yeah, but that was a different world because teen horror films now are sort of um are sort of a parody because of the scream films and um, the scream films have become extremely popular um especially even more since urban legend one and so i felt that any any uh teen horror movie i was gonna do that tried to take itself seriously was gonna be laughed off the screen in a way in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a bad way you know and so i went back and forth with, with New Regency, trying to explain why I didn't want to do it. And they came back to me and they said, well, what, what, what if we make it something that's more elevated? You know, something that's, that's more intelligent, you know, would you like it, would you do it then? Would you do it then? And I said, well, yeah, that would be fun um, for me. Um, so, uh, but I said, I just want you to know, and I had this clairvoyance already. I said, if, <laughs> if this is a sequel to a film where dogs are exploding in microwaves and or people being fed, force fed Drano, um, do they people or is this audience for urban legends going to want a sequel to be more elevated at all you know <laughs> and um they go well yeah i know it should be it could be different i go okay so i i, I went on board and we came up with the film school concept in a way to to make it more H hitchcockian really where you don't see the first murder it's off screen so it's, it's more of a mystery and a thriller uh angle to the to the film and um <laughs> so long story short we tested the movie uh, excuse me, and it actually tested extremely well for our first test, but um, the, the, the main uh, critique was we want to see more people die, and of course, <laughs> you know, and so then we tested again, and it tested much lower, and that was the overriding uh, comment. They wanted more basically just in-your-face horror, and so I said, well, great, so then we went off and we came up with this idea of, of this um, of a film student we hadn't met yet, you know, which was Jacinda Barrett, and, uh, who was this uh, model, I think, and we, we got for the part and um, came up with the scene where, you know, she gets her head cut off in the, in the window. And I just, I was there on this, you know, when I was on the set, I, you know, I just want to go for it because if we're going to do this, I'm into it, you know? So um, I, I had her throw the, throw her, what, her, her kidneys out the window and had the dog eat them. And, and uh, it was so, became so over the top that even even the studio head um, at Sony, she was like, I don't know, this might be just too much. I said, no, it's not too much at all. You know, let's just do, do it. You know, and so that became a huge crowd pleaser, that scene to open to to put early in the movie. Um, but now you're setting forth an aesthetic that the audience thinks they're going to get, which is, um, you know, that kind of stuff happening all the time in the film. And then I sort of lapsed back into the film I'd made, which was more of a uh hitchcockian thriller you know um at, and now and, and now i think people are revisiting you know the movie and realizing that and sort of embracing the element of it which is the the hitchcockian thing and the play on on uh, the allegory to other films and so forth yeah what's interesting about it is that the scene that you're talking about that you added um is actually the the biggest connection to the whole urban legends concept um yes because, i mean th there are a couple of mentions of uh, urban legends in the cafeteria scene for example a couple of throwaway lines and, and stuff like that right but the, the whole kidney heist idea that's i mean taken from the first film where it's um where people talk about it and, and here we yeah. see it actually happening so was there a, a lot of discussion about um how to really uh, connect to this idea of urban legends yes i mean the fact is that there's, there's not as many um urban legends as you think <laughs> so <laughs> well we uh, they had used up so many of them in the first film we were sort of stymied as to come up with other ones uh and um, and then other one and, and I mean you can look up a, a lots of our legends but not, they not be they may not be cinematic or something that, that makes sense for a horror movie um, that you can even make scary so um, that's that was our struggle is we didn't really have a lot of material to, to work with at this point for a new movie called Urban Legends too <laughs> so um, we had to find other ways of making 
it interesting, which I guess was the thriller aspect or the, the, the mystery aspect, of course, of who the killer is, which is you know, common to all of these movies. Yeah, I spoke to Jamie Blanks, the director of the original film, and he said that he really felt sorry for the people working on the sequel because they had used up all the good urban legends in the first right. movie. <laughs> right, yeah. So again, I, you know, when I, after I said yes to the movie, then we started re looking at all the urban legends that, that really wouldn't work for this movie. I was like, oh, now we're, we're screwed, you know. So, uh, so, so in that regard, I think, um, you know, I think it's... Uh, kind of proud we kind of pulled a movie off period <laughs> it's enough, without without the material that we that we actually needed yeah i guess it's more a little bit more about uh horror movies not so much about urban legends but horror movies or horror yeah. tropes in a way and i think that yeah. again connects to the origin the, the origin of, of urban legends in a way yeah you know some of them were were, were even less of a what weren't uh, so subtle but um, you know, it, it's it, it, I, I I had fun, you know, especially uh, in retrospect. I my my couple of references to Alien were were a little too much, I think. Um, but I just I was I was having so much fun, um, kind of emulating moments like when she's running down this hall, all the flashing lights, and I said I need steam coming out of the of the of the, of the size of the hall, you know, of, of the tunnel, or whatever she's in. And, um, you know, and shaking the camera around, it was just like that mo moment where Ripley is running through the Stromo to the shuttle, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know and some people were like, oh, brother, come on, like, how, how obvious can you get? But I mean, I just, I wanted to do some things like that, you know. When you came on board, you said that you came up with the idea of the film school setting. Um, so um, was there any script at that point or uh, did the script develop as you went along? The script developed because well before we we found the I think before we found the location for the school, I came up with the idea that there needs to be a tower, and you know because that's sort of you know mysterious and lights coming on on the tower kind of reminds me of uh, some haunted house film you know where you see something happen and then the you know the, in the distance the lights go on and that's where the bodies were and where we'd have like a, a climax there so I was big on this having the, the school have a tower. Uh, and which was in our, you know, was way, way a little beyond our production uh, budget to build a tower. So we looked for schools with a tower that would work and good. they were all gothic, you know, or older schools, which were like in the first movie. And, it, and because this was sort of a film school and, and it was supposed to be a little more edgy, um, I, I, I decided to try to find a place that was modern. So let's find, let's find a modern uh, location if it exists. And then lo and behold, we found this super modern school um, out in the middle of nowhere in, uh, in Canada. I can't remember what the, what the town was now. Um, and so the production designer built that, built that tower. You know, so, and put lights and everything. Obviously, it was uh, not, not big enough to go in. But um, so it, looked, it, it became a nice visual uh, motif in the film, the tower. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and I love the look of the school. Um, I was really proud of that and, uh, and what, what the production designer was able to do, um, you know, like the, the office for the, um, the, the teacher, the, what do you call it, the, the, the head of the film school um, mm -hmm. was basically we, we emptied out um, a section of the library and built walls in there so we could have a view behind him at the school. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, those are things you always do with production design, but I think it, we pulled it off pretty well, you know. Yeah, I think it makes for a nice contrast uh, to the first movie, which has this very yeah. gothic feel to it, very old buildings and, and very dark right. and overloaded uh, with imagery. And here this, there's this clean architecture and, like you say, very right. modern. Um, interestingly, um, it, it's the, the screenplay you wrote with, um, or the screenplay was written by Paul Harris Boardman and Scott Derrickson, and I think that was one of their first films, right? Yeah, yeah, and they, they did a great job because, uh, again, this thing was in flux constantly when I came in and I wanted it kind of overhauled and, and I didn't rewrite it, but I, I just, you know, as a director, you kind of direct the rewriting of it based upon ideas you have. And they really, uh, the studio and, and they were completely open and just took my ideas and made them work. Um, and then a lot of ideas, of course, uh, you come up with on the set. Um, you know, moments where you have a, you know, a light bulb go off and you're like, hold on everything, let's, let's do this differently. Um, like the guns on the floor and all that. That, 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 was, that was an idea I had at the moment. And I said, what? no, 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 let's have the whole racks fall over and let's, try, let's have the gun not be obvious. Let's have them try to find the gun, you know. 
And so that was a thing, something that just happened right then and there. I just had this, this, this thing on the set. Um, uh, and it was, and sometimes it was hard on that film because it was my first movie and it wasn't like I'm Steven Spielberg walking in and despite the fact they had a lot of faith in what I was doing, anytime you change like one word of dialogue, it had to be full, you know, meetings and, 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 and uh, calls on the phone and, and debates. And like, I want to change it from I to V, you know, you know seriously. And so, um, and so I, I really wanted to change the dialogue a lot, but it was so, it was so cumbersome to change the dialogue, just getting approval, you know, um, because in retrospect, you know, there's some cheesy dialogue for sure. And um, uh, I, I, you know, if, if I had they had the time before shooting to sit down and actually go through and step back from what was some of the dialogue, I would have uh, kind of de-cheesified some of it, you know. <laughs> but but nevertheless, it was it was a it was a great job they did, and and uh, with a lot of uh, uh, it was a, a subject the project was very in flux as they all are, you know, trying to get, get a script kind of a complete overhauled from from the original idea whatever that was i can't even remember um to what it was to a shooting script yeah uh was the original script uh was that always intended to be like a, a sequel to urban legends or was that a like did they... yeah it was always it was it was always a sequel to urban legends and it was always mm. it was in a film school um but uh and i i've been what 21 years you said so i can't exactly remember <laughs> I have no idea what the original script was. All I know is like, you know, we, we you know, if we're going to go the Hitchcockian route, you know, which, which we didn't, it didn't have that kind of flavor at all to it. Um, it was just, a, it was just the same old thing with, with, with fewer urban legends and in the same kind of school. And it was like, well, you know, this is going to be sort of a downer. We've got to, if, if, if it's, if, if we're going to make a sequel, the only, the only way we're going to uh, have a chance of making it somewhat interesting and successful is to change it up, you know? And so then, and of course, of course, that was the studio's uh, um, offer to me too. If we can make it, you know, elevated. <laughs> <laughs> now, did some of your experiences from film school go into that, uh, in, in, into the movie, into the setting of the film school? Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, uh, there's this, you always have any well, not just film school, but any school you're in, and university, you have uh, professors with interesting quirks and. And, uh, you know, I, and I did have a math teacher in high school, actually, who would sit there at his desk and would literally just like, almost like instantly fall asleep. And so there was this one teacher in the beginning where, you know, we had him constantly nodding off, you know, but, uh, you know, and you have your, your very esoteric snobby teachers. And so we had one of, one of them and, and, uh, and uh, I liked uh, Hart Brockner's take on um, his character because he was kind of cool teacher you know uh, he was a teacher you can find because it just kind of felt like you know the kids kind of felt like he was one of them in a way you know um and that was um i just say it was a lot of him uh with that giving that idea to to be that kind of character which was a good move and then uh speaking of dialogue just skipping to the end um i, I don't remember what his monologue was back then but it was uh not anything that he, he actually ended up saying and that became a huge deal at the time i was like what are you doing we have we you know we have a schedule to keep but i'm you know it's like you want to have a meeting to my trailer for an hour oh fuck you know so um but he says look i gotta talk to you so he went in we went into my trailer and he, he just laid out what he should say you know given the same revelation but still why this character did things and and um and I read it and, you know, as a director, you have to step back sometimes from what you think is the most right thing to do and just, and just take, take it all in. And, and I was like, you know what, this is actually better. It is because normally when an actor has an idea, you're kind of, you're kind of leery, you know, is this, is this going to be self-serving for the actor? Is this all some idea to make them look great or whatever? Or is it really based upon, you know, what, the character? And he really dove into the character and, and what the character would say. And so uh, this became another big giant thing with the studio, hours and hours of delay, but he but ended up um, transcribing, you know, what, what he came up with. And that became his big monologue at the end, which I think really worked great because it was, it was more down to earth as opposed to so fanciful as a lot of these uh, bad guy monologues are in the end. Mm -hmm. And I think he's an interesting casting choice because, um, I mean, obviously you've seen Die Hard and so I never quite right. trust the guy when he appears on screen. Right, right. right, <laughs> um, right. But he's not so much a, um, like 
um, when you watch the first movie, you have people like Brad Dourif or Robert England who have bring all sort of screen history with them, and you have sort of certain yeah. expectations, uh, which doesn't happen with Hart Bachner. I mean, he could very easily be just the cool teacher or just somebody who happens to be important um, during the plot, but there's nothing really that um, right, no giveaway about him. Um, right, he's slick right. enough to be that kind of uh, that kind of murderer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of names, I mean, he was, I guess, somewhat of a name. People knew who he was. And, and we had um, 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 who played the guard, um, the security guard. Uh, Loretta um, Devine. Loretta Devine. Uh, and so obviously we had to have her because she was the thread between the two films and, and also a name. And then the studio decided we're just not going to have any other names in the film. There was one name they had for the lead. Um, and I forgot who she was, but I just didn't think she was right for the part. So um, we ended up just going for, for all newcomers. And um, I really fought hard for Jennifer Morrison. I just felt she was, she was the right thing. And so we literally had a number of screen tests um, with a few actresses and, and, um, and uh, just to, so I could prove my point, we actually went out and shot some scenes uh, so I could prove to them that, that she'd be right for the part, you know? Um, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, she's a, she's an interesting lead. I think she's more low key, more subtle than um, yeah. lead actresses in other movies who are maybe a little bit more glamorous. Or um... yeah, and I think that's that's the kind of actress they wanted. Uh, some some like glamorous, big tits, and you know, and all that kind of thing. And I just I just felt well, this it's just not going to make it feel real, you know. So so her is a documentary. Uh, the, the daughter of a famous documentary filmmaker, and you know, she's a little more intellectual and. Uh, I just wanted that kind of character for, for her. Whether that was the right choice or not, I don't know. But she was she was uh, really great, with, uh, great, great, great the part, and she was uh, extremely fun to work with. We were she, she was I always called her like a little filmmaker in her in her own right because she had great instincts, as a lot of actors do. But she would she would know what I'm going for at, as as the director, and then she would you know uh, then she would just let me. Um, you know, give me a lot of leeway, you know, and so uh, that that was, you know, she was great to work with. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because she's gone on to to be a director, actually. Um, Has she? Yeah, I think she works in TV as a director. Oh, still working oh, okay. as an yeah, actress, I know but she's also an as, actress a, as a director. Long. That, makes, that makes sense, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet another very interesting newcomer in the cast, which is Eva Mendes, um, who I think oh, was right. yeah. basically I unknown at that Eva point, Mendes. right? Yes, I can always credit myself as the man who discovered Eva Mendes. I, I saw um, she, she 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 didn't have much on her demo reel, you know, at all. But there was a little tiny moment in uh, an ER episode, and I was like, you know what? She, that she, I could tell right then and there she had something, and so um, uh, we brought her in. But uh, we had other other people up for the part too, and uh, I remember she came in. She was wearing this T-shirt, and it said, um, it said something like. Uh, I go both ways or something like that. It was like, you know, and, and I was like, huh, that's interesting um, because she she was kind of implying to me that she was, you know, bisexual or something. So uh, for the part, or I don't know. So, uh, but but that wasn't the reason I, I hired her. I just think um, she she was uh, she she really worked for the part, and um, it was her idea to sort of push the lesbian. Uh, angle for her character. Um, I don't believe that in the script um, it ever mentioned that she had feelings for um, for Amy in in that way. It was uh, she was supposed to be, just be her friend, her pal, you know. Mm -hmm. And she sort of pushed this, uh, you know, this sort of suggestion that she was, you know, into her. And so I, I have to give her credit for that. And I think it might have started right there at her um, when she came in for her um, audition, you know. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, again, it's it's a nice touch. Um, I think it's it's just a little extra that you know yeah. um, fleshes out the characters just a little bit and and makes you interested in the people who are on screen, which I, is sometimes a problem in a horror movie. I think um, when yeah. people are yeah. just victims, um, anonymous right. cannon fodder in a way. Yeah, and I think for her, it probably was like, hey, I can make my character even more interesting, you know. <clears throat> to pop off the screen more, be re remembered. <laughs> so, but but it worked for the story, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, when we were shooting, she became somewhat of a of a 
stress point for me because she was always upset she wasn't getting enough lines or um, screen time. And, um, but she was right in some ways because she wasn't a main character. And I remember there was this walk and talk, for instance, and she, she could sense the coverage going on and she knew the camera wasn't on her as much as the other actors. And so she, she came to me and she goes, you know, dude, it's like, you know, I need, I need my, my close up as a word as well. And, um, but I'm glad she did that because she became such a fun character and actually a key character for, for, with Amy, you know, being a, such a, um, a pal of hers um, that um, I'm glad she pushed me to do that. Um, Cause sometimes you're sort of, you're so focused on the main character as the victim of the movie, or you're just honing on her and, and, um, and then her love interest, whatever. And, um, and you forget about a really key character that she's, that she's with. Uh, speaking of Ava Mendez, I do remember one moment. Also this is off screen moment. Cause you know, I mean, everyone knows I, most people know I'm gay, but, but back then no one, a lot of people didn't really know that. And I, and I, I didn't care whether people I knew or not. I was never uh, uh, shy from just, you know, letting people know, but I would also, also didn't go out of my way to tell anybody. It's like, it didn't matter to me, right? So um, uh, we were at, at having lunch and I can't remember now how it came out that, that, um, that I was gay, but I just, it was just something in passing or something. And, she's, and she was like, oh my God, I think that is so cool. <laughs> I go, what, that I'm gay? And she goes, no, that you just like, you know, it's like that, that, that you just don't say anything or about it or whatever. And then just, it's kind of comes out that you are, and it's like no big deal, you know? And, and then mm-hmm. I just, I don't know, you have these little moments you never forget. I, I was just like, she thought that was so cool, you know? So <laughs> um, I don't know, I just, that's a moment in your life that you just sort of ingrained in my head, that, that little, uh, that little um, uh, having lunch with her, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she sounds like a cool person. Yeah, yeah. Um, as long as you give her her lines. I can't get more lines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know what? One of my favorite moments of her is actually when uh, she's sitting there at that long table in that room that's being remodeled, you know, and she thinks that, you know, Amy has sent her all, sent her all these uh, notes, you know, and she really plays it so well. She thinks she knows everything. And, uh, and I had, I just kind of had the camera stay on her and kind of revolving around her and, and um, and I love the way she 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 played that you know really well mm-hmm. done. Yeah, it's true. That's a little character moment that always makes you wish that we could explore the character just a little further. Yes, uh, but no, we're in the, sort it's of true. in the wrong movie for that. <laughs> yeah, it was really that scene. We're like, huh? I, I'd like to see a lot more of her. And then uh, and then the way she played uh, very subtly. Um, I may have directed her this way. I have to give myself some credit here about. I may have directed her to do this, but um, I don't remember who who did what, but. Uh, when Amy tells her, well, I didn't, I didn't send any letters and her reaction is just so, um, so real, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a very quiet moment actually. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. It was meant to be because uh, one of that body falling from, from the ceiling, which was another idea of mine. Um, uh, then that was another idea that came up with like on, on when we explored the, the location. Um, I wanted it to be such a scare. So I want to be very quiet and long moments for that, I think just go boom, you know, and scare the hell out of people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the setting of the the film school, the campus, and everything. I think that gave you a, a, a huge opportunity to do a lot with different settings. Like you had not just a campus, um, but you had actual film sets. You have like a, the, the graveyard set, and you have this little yeah, science fiction was, set and, and stuff like that. That was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, I I really wanted there to be these non sequitur you know, um, connections between these sets and so disparate from each other, you know. And um, again, we were on a shoestring budget and I said, I really want a spaceship set. And the product designer was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, so, but they came up with this, you know, quick, cheap spaceship set and they got this mannequin. Because um, the reason I wanted it said as well, I wanted, I wanted um, when Toby was blasted through the wall to, no, was that he blasted the wall? Yeah, and have it go straight into this bizarre, like what, where are we kind of moment um, where um, it went into this this in this face of an alien, you know, it just wanted to be like, what, where are we now? So uh, they came up with that and they found this mannequin and uh, basically some Halloween masks this woman got from somewhere and and uh, put the alien in the chair and uh, and it became, it became a real fun, uh, very quick, uh, moment for the alien but uh a uh 
yeah, a fun transition, you know. And then, then it was great to have, you know, Hart Bachter be able to walk through that set for just a moment to keep it, to keep uh, the, just to keep it interesting for all this um, looking around for, I think for Amy and, and, um, and, uh, and, you know, all the filler dialogue he had and so forth, you know, to, to make the backdrop, you know, fun. Yeah. And it was also obviously in the spirit of the film. So it wasn't exactly mm -hmm. um, out of nowhere that, that this, that, that it didn't seem like it, it didn't seem like it didn't make sense because it was after all in a film school soundstage, a very, uh, very, I would say, uh, uh, amazing film school where they have so many of these <laughs> sets you know, built <laughs> yeah i mean they do have a lot of equipment but it's the orson welles <laughs> film school or i, I don't right. know the name but I, th I think orson welles was the name on of the school yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i think it fits into the into the era where um like you said earlier horror films sort of became a parody um they sort of became self-aware in a way movies were yeah. sort of showing that yes i'm a movie or it's a movie and we're breaking the fourth wall and we're sort of toying with the idea right. also with the with the awareness of the audience of that yeah i often wonder had this film come out where there was never an urban legends movie before it um and came out five years six years earlier uh if it would have been you know um gone down in history differently you know mm -hmm. it's not that i'm saying this is uh this movie has gone with the wind or anything but um i think it was really uh, came out at the wrong time in a way you know um mm -hmm. where again the heel on the heels of, of another film that it had to be like and also during the whole scream uh phase of horror where it was horror was kind of a joke yeah mm. Yeah, it was sort of at the tail end, I think, of another era of slasher movies. And um, yeah. I think even at the er in the early 80s, um, people were growing kind of tired of slasher movies um, because there were so yeah. many of them. And then there was another, like a, re a renewed interest in them. And then again, yeah. you had so many slasher films that I think a lot of them sort of went under in a way that people weren't really looking at them uh, with a fresh eye anymore. Right, right, yeah. Now, one of the sure. one of the sets of that film school, um, I think, is um, that must have been heaven for you to direct, which is the scene set in the scoring stage. Right, yeah, that was another <laughs> thing we came up with. Um, well, actually, the music stand thing we came up with on I came up with uh, on the day, but uh, it was supposed to be in a scoring stage on the script, of course, and um, I can't remember how that came about. Whether that was. Uh, the writers trying to do that for me or I came up with it. I, I have no idea. I don't remember, but um, I liked it because of the, the booth and uh, you know, her being in one side of the glass and, and, uh, and the bad guy on the other side, that was, that was a real fun moment, uh, especially with the sort of moon, moon mask. Yet. <laughs> I don't know what that <laughs> thing was, um, but yeah, but then you walk out and she was just simply supposed to run through the stage and get out. And on there, I know on the day I thought, well, there was this piano and all these music stands and like, well, let's make this really uh, more violent in a way. And so I, I as, as in the script, I'm, as in the, not, not in the script, but as in the film, as everyone knows now, I, I had her run under the piano. It was probably a dumb thing for her to do, um, but I wanted him to sort of walk over and sort of do this like, bah, bah, on the keys, having it louder and louder, it's more intense. And then when she blasts out, um, have them just kind of tear through all those music stands. So again, it, it, it's, it's those examples of how a location um, inspires a director, you know, and this, this happens all the time where you're suddenly there and you're like, wait a minute, I have this idea, you know, and just enhances uh, the scene and, and I think played into the horror element even better. You know? I like how it combines the... Um the sounds within the scene with the score of the scene like he's actually providing right. his own score and then she hits yes. uh, the chimes in the in the room yeah and that becomes right. part of the soundtrack too <laughs> yeah yeah so again that that's uh, i think when the studio saw that they were so pleased because that was just completely off script and that's something i didn't really ask for permission i just did it you know um and uh and it just it, it made it a little more original because uh, from the sound stage, then she runs out into a forest, and they really wanted to have this Blair Witch element of the of the movie where she's running through the forest, and so um, that was my least favorite thing to do, but that was something they really want they want really wanted. So um, at least before that happened, I got to do something a little more original. You know? 
Mm -hmm. Now, it's kind of unusual that a director edits and scores his own film. Um, but I mean, like I said earlier, you're, you're known as an editor and a composer. Was there any discussion about bringing in somebody else or was that a given? No, they, they, no, they actually everything? did. We, no, they, there, was, there was no one available really uh, to, to, to work on the film and post. And everyone was busy on other projects and this was a lower budget movie. So there wasn't a lot of it. Uh, um, attraction to do a little low, low, low budget horror film for you know established um, editors. Um, so I hired a guy um, who had done a couple of films for um, um, oh, some actor's son or something, but I um, can't remember now what the actor's name was, but he, I, he came on and um, uh, and so, cause you have to have someone cutting while you're shooting. You know, and so I remember because you're you're always very um, insecure as a director, even though you have a good handle on it and you're confident in what you're doing. You're there's always an insecurity, and I remember it was this simple walk and talk scene, um, the one where Ava wanted more coverage, and um, and I, the editor sent his cut, you know, um, to to Toronto because he's in he was in L.A. He sent it. He sent the cut, and I and it was like just a walk and talk scene was incomprehensible uh, editorially. And, and I was like, how's this possible? And then he would tell me it just, the scene just doesn't cut together. It just doesn't cut together. And so I'm thinking in my head, how's this possible? It's like, I, I'm an editor. It's like, I, 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 I just standard covered. It's like, how, it, it's impossible that this can go together. And so I would, so I would say for the latter half of the movie, I was so alarmed while I was cutting the film, while I was shooting the film, because um, I was either, I was freaked out that either I had no idea what I was doing and thought I did, or this guy had no idea what he was doing. And um, it was indeed the, the, the latter where, <laughs> where when I got back, I mean, it was um, just bizarro things he would do that didn't, I, I, that, that I was just sort of uh, defied all rational um, uh, filmmaking. I mean, so there was a scene <laughs> where, where the guy in an alley being bludgeoned to death by the, by the camera lens, you know, and he lays there and so i'm watching his edit of the scene and and um he says watch this so the guy's laying there and all of a sudden he disappears like he beamed up or something and i said what what this what what and you know why he goes well the cam was locked off so i could have him disappear <laughs> i said yeah it's not, it's not a supernatural movie it's like he's dead it's like what, what are you doing you know and so i was like holy shit i'm i'm so fucked right now um so, but sometimes, you know, uh, fate deals you a, a, a good hand where, um, he was a really nice guy, but uh, he came to me one day kind of forlorn and he said, you know, John, I, I, I feel terrible, but I have to go because I got a huge job opportunity to be vice president of Avid. And I said, oh, oh that's so terrible. <laughs> uh, oh, this is awful, but uh, bye, you know, so. Um, so then I went in and had to recut, you know, um, a lot of the stuff he'd done. And um, uh, yeah, so th that's, uh, so then I ended up, I didn't really, I mean, you know, I'm a control freak. Of course I would have gone in and, um, and recut sequences or been over his shoulder, but I never, I never thought, maybe I was deluding myself that I would actually be cutting the whole film. Um, because as you know, you're, you're so overwhelmed with all the other responsibilities uh, as a director, but I was used to that doing so many things for Brian Singer, there wasn't anything I wasn't involved in in those, in those movies. So I it was used to multitasking, um, but it, as usual with, uh, as with Brian's movies, it made it very difficult to have the time to write the fricking score because I was so busy editing the film, but I was used to it already. So I guess that's how I, you know, pulled it off. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was a trying moments, you know. <laughs> Does your experience as a as an editor and as a composer does that bear on your uh, directing? Um, does that influence the way that you um, set up a scene or um, that you? I guess I mean it all. Everything informs your brain in some way, but I, I would like to say I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, well, yes, I have to say yes because I actually I've just directed something the Star Trek Discovery episode and. And I, I think my editorial mind was indeed working because mm -hmm. it saves you. I mean, this is why in the old days, editors became directors because they, you could, you could almost foresee in the editing room what, what's going to blow up in your face, how much coverage you really need or not. And you always want to cover yourself, of course, because you never know what epiphanies might happen in an editing room. But you definitely have an eye for 
for what you're definitely never going to use. And so in that regard, I think I look at things editorially, but I also like to think that I'm not thinking, you know, just like, um, like an editor when I am facing a scene and then I'm, I'm sort of all encompassing as a, as a director, but um, it all informs you, of course. And then, and then the other thing too, as a composer, I guess, um, music is, as with editing, is telling a story, right? So mm-hmm. I am sort of adept at two, uh, well, three things uh, that are all story element, story related. Composing is telling a story, editing is telling a story for sure. And so it's directing. So um, they all work together. So if I'm directing a scene and I know it's going to be a big score moment, I'll, I'll shoot it that way, you know, um, or especially as an editor, if I know it's going to be a big score moment, I will purposely, you know, uh, linger on a shot or something, and I know, linger on a wide shot, knowing it's going to be um, a big score moment. What that score moment's going to be, I don't know, but I know it's going to be mm-hmm. a moment that, a moment in the film where it should be driven by score, you know. Oh, and also I would say as uh, it's going into something different, I'm just, something's coming to my head. Um, you know, you have to learn as a director of how to let go of things, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and fortunately, as an, I think because of the editor side of me, it enables me to, uh, enabled me as a director to more easily let things go where a first time editor director might not do that. We, uh, there was some scene outside the school. We had this, this gigantic crane we spent a ton of money for that day. It was some big fancy shot. It was an amazing shot. And um, it just took too much screen time. And so in the end, I, you know, in the editing room, I immediately just cut it out. It was, it was depressing to do it, but I knew it was just, it would drag the film. And I think sometimes maybe a, a first time director who didn't have that mindset would fight for that crane shot forever until realizing it was bogging the film down, you know, mm. so these are the things that I think helped, helped me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it's usually the danger when a director edits his own films that he knows how much work yeah. went into everything. And um... or especially when a DP becomes a director and they, <laughs> they, they edit, they're involved in editing and man, it's just like all about the shots, not about the story, you know? So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like, it, like it's actually easier for you when you're both the editor and the composer. Well, you know, it's just like when I when I score and edit, it's easier in one way because I'm so uh, familiar. Like if I'm editing and scoring, I'm so familiar as, with the film as the editor that scoring is easier in one way because I know the film so well. I know the challenges. I know the skeletons in the closet. I know, you know, but the flip side is I just have no time to write the score because the editing never stops, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's a nightmare. And so I think it's the same with... Uh, you know, an editor being the director, being the, I'm sorry, director being the editor and the composer, it's like you have, you have just less time to do those jobs, but, um, but yeah, you're so much more informed in what you're doing. And, and, uh, but so I guess, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it all even evens out. It's, you know, I think in in the end of the day, I guess it's, you could say that's advantage. Um, There's also something to be said for object objectivity which I trained myself to have, but I think a lot of the danger in a director, you know, editing his own thing sometimes is, is, you know, don't have fresh eyes. So it's almost good to work. If you find a really, if if I found a really talented editor to work with on another film I direct, it would would be great. You know, um, I would still be a nightmare for them, but at least (laughs) I have someone constructing something that, that, and they, they're doing it well, you know, and and also seeing, seeing something slightly different than I, I would. And I, I, you know, any director, I think embraces that, you know, this is why Brian Singer would stay away from me for months while I was editing. A lot of it was laziness, but the other, other but boy, he, would, he would justify it by saying, well, I need to maintain my objectivity. So when he would walk in, you know, he basically wanted to forget about his movie. So when he walked in, he would sort of not be attached to any preconceived notions and didn't want to influence me as to what those notions might be because I might do something better. So that, that's, there is basically some, definitely something to be said for uh, stepping back from your film. Mm-hmm. So we briefly touched upon the um, like the reception of, of uh, Urban Legends 2 when you say that maybe it would have been uh, better if the movie had been released a couple of years earlier. So how did you experience yeah. the, the, the reception of the film? Um, well, it, it's, it was, you know, it's highs and lows because when we, our first test, the scores went through the ceiling. We tested in Pasadena, California. I guess that's a good place to test. And we were on cloud nine and uh, I remember people commenting on the directing literally uh, in the, in the score uh, sheets that they filled out. 
And so we were just riding high. And then um, we retested after we did some stuff to the film, um, not substantial stuff, a couple months later in Sherman Oaks, another area of, of uh, LA. And it went 20 points down. But I knew, I knew walking into the theater, we were in trouble because you can feel the room. A, um, I saw the people in line, like they were like, why are we even here? You know, so the rec recruited audience was just like, I, I didn't know who these people were. And then we got in and the sound, for some reason, sounded like this, this old muffled for a horror movie. And I was like sitting in my seat squirming. There's nothing I could do about it by that time. And I, by that point, um, and uh, I knew just the moment the film started, we were fucked, you know, so the scores went down and I saw the, the ashen faces of the executives. You know? and so, um so I think after that test, we decided to go back and, and came up with the Jacinda uh, thing where getting her head cut off and starting the film out that way. You know. The ultimate reception, um, you know, um, it, it was number one at the theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was during the Olympics where there wasn't anything out really. And, um, <laughs> uh, and um, we competed against the Exorcist re-release. Uh, re, re and we, ed we edged it out just slightly so we could call ourselves the number one film in America, which we were legitimately, we, it was the number one film. And so that made me very happy. Um, and uh, um, I can't, you know, but then you read the reviews and it's like, you know, uh, not that I didn't, I wasn't expecting people to say this was, you know, uh, an amazing movie, but um, it was, it's depressing no matter what, no matter how you, uh, try to justify what you might have been expecting when you read them. And sometimes people, you know, are very brutal with reviews and they love being brutal. And then, then the haters come on. And so it, it's, you just have to not read some of this stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, and I can't say that, you know, I'm object objected to know that a lot of the things that were in the reviews were correct, you know, um, but a lot were unfair, you know. But um, one, once people smell, they taste meat or smell red meat or whatever, or smell blood or how do we say, it, taste blood, they, they all, you know, come and come to the feast, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, like you say, people like being, or reviewers like being brutal in a way. I mean, when you look at yeah. the, the, the Wikipedia site of the movie, I think it says just right at the beginning that it's universally panned, um, receiving <laughs> negative reviews. And like, yeah, I mean, come on. Um, I think yeah, there's another. Yeah, I did read that. Thank, thanks for reminding me of that. I don't think I remember that Wikipedia thing or I ever read it, but now that I know, <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of great stuff in the movie. Um, like like many movies it's not a perfect movie there's a, a, a lot of stuff that you know sure. could have been different or, or um yeah but i mean and, uh, there's... you know I, I was the first time uh directing a feature and you know i look back and again it's those a lot of that dialogue um uh, oof, it's it's hard to listen it's hard you know and today <laughs> i would have gone what the hell we got to rewrite all this stuff and i would have put my foot down but of course i was first time guy i didn't have the, the clout or the authority to say look I'm, I'm not going to have them say this, you know, so, uh, and so uh, giving credit to the actors, we knew right then and there when there was mm -hmm. some, ba some bad lines and I credit them for trying to, to huddle with me on how to best say the lines so that they didn't sound as bad as they were, you know, and so they, they, again, I, I really credit them as little filmmakers as, as, as huddling with me and saying, oh, how are we going to pull this off? Because we, they had to say certain things um yeah you know today i would have had maybe the, the position of saying we need to rewrite these lines and then perhaps um uh some of the performances i wouldn't have allowed to be as uh cookie cutter you know as as some of them were um uh having said that i was really proud of proud of other moments where you know i did direct the actors to, to come down or or be funny and you know i think a, a lot of loretta's um antics in the by herself when she's uh you know in the security room i came up with her doing a lot of that stuff and so i think that really um amped up and made it more fun um yeah mm. but, yeah the one thing that always stuck with me is the um the moment that you already mentioned with the guns uh, where they're frantically looking for the right gun yeah. and you just have all these prop guns um yeah and that's oh, just over the years that was the first thing that came to my mind always um just you know horror films on a horror film set um i think that's yeah. that's a perfect moment yeah yeah i'm so glad that, that there were so many guns in those racks because i wouldn't be able to uh, on the fly come up with that yeah mm.
so I saw that you have a new project as a director uh, coming up, uh, a biopic of Vivaldi, I think. Yeah, it's uh, it's a film that's in development. Meaning, meaning development. Meaning, you know, it may be a film that never goes. But I'm, 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 uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about it because the studio is actually spending money to have uh, the the original writer of the film um, rewrite the script. It's a script that's been around for 15 years, in and out of production. Ron Howard was going to do it, and that fell through. And then it was another director. Um, female director, I forgot her name, that, that was on the cusp of being shot. And then it just, they shut down production. This was maybe 10 years ago. And um, it basically, it's a Vivaldi, it's a biopic about Vivaldi. And it's a terrific story. Um, and I just came across the script, this, this old Italian man, after I won the Oscar for uh, The Human Rhapsody, he came to me and he said, you have to do this movie, this movie, you're the one that can get this movie off the ground. And because he had been music supervisor in all those iterations for the last 15 years of, of the film. And so I brought it to the Regency, who I had a good relationship with because of Bohemian Rhapsody. And um, they really dug the idea, but they wanted the script rewritten. So um, it's being rewritten right now. And so we don't have a first draft yet. Um, and, you know, so it'll go first draft and how long before the second draft, and then the second draft comes, is there a rewrite of that? But it's a, who knows, you know, where it will go. But I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic that um, it's be something that, um, but when I'm 65, we can probably start getting off the ground. <laughs> you know, it's like, it takes forever. I'm literally, it's like, I brought this script to them maybe two years ago. And it's like, it's crazy how long deals take. I mean, just the writer's deal alone took six months just to rewrite the script, you know. And so, um, but now we're, I think we're finally, I uh, have a little momentum. So we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's an anniversary coming up or something like uh, uh, <laughs> the Vivaldi's death or something. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's a tough thing. It's a tough. It's a. It's a really great story, but the uh, inevitable comparisons will be to uh, Amadeus, and so that's a danger. Mm -hmm. But you know. But then again, I've taught a lot of people, and they're like, "Oh, that was so long ago." People won't remember. I'm like, "Are you kidding? Amadeus? It's like one of the greatest <laughs> films ever made." You know. <laughs> so, but but it's a it's it's a totally different story, of course, and um, it's a guy about this guy who. Uh, Vivaldi, of course, became a priest, um, and um, our story is sort of like he wasn't that devout and became a priest so that he could be commissioned to write music, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, but as a priest, if you slip up and and mess around with a girl, back then it was a little more than excommunication. You were sent off to this leper leper island um, in uh, in uh, Venice. So um, there's a very Machiavellian friend of his who's waiting for him to mess up who's also climbing the, the power ladder of the church and and uh anyway it's a much broader story but it, it's basically uh forbidden love film mm -hmm. um meets amadeus yeah mm -hmm. yeah and I which, guess which is a... uh which you would never expect in one way you would you, you would expect me to do a film like this because it's musically oriented but mm -hmm. in another way you'd never expect me to do a film like this because it's not sci-fi i'm a big sci-fi guy you mm -hmm. know star trek and it's not it's it's not like a thriller it's you know it's it's a love story so but again it's like i always tell people people say what do you want to direct i think this is true for any director or a lot of directors like i don't care as long as it's a good story you know so mm. and and the fact that it's a period piece is in, in a way almost like a science fiction backdrop for me it's it's not <laughs> it's not present day anything you know so it, it's interesting uh to go back in time you know yeah, that was actually my reaction too. Like I thought, okay, this makes sense. It's a, about a composer, so I can see the right. like the connection. Um, but yeah, it's also something different because, like you say, yeah. um, there's so much uh, genre um, in your filmography that um, I think it will be interesting to see that different side of. Um, yeah, I mean, one way it, it enables me to leapfrog over all the little crappy things I'd have to do to get to to do a film like that. Um, because I did waste, I wouldn't say wasted, but for lack of a better term, I wasted a lot of years, you know, being trapped in editing jail. And, you know, and so I was unable to go and, and sort of do a lot of films that would get me to that point. I mean, it's, you know, everyone has a crossroads in their life. And one after Urban Legends was mine, because after that film, I was offered all sorts of teen movies. <laughs> and, and I don't know if it was the right choice, or the wrong choice, but I, I was offered Dude, Where's My Car? And I just read the cover page of the script. And I said, I'm not gonna do a film like this. I'm never gonna read the script. You know, it's like, I was just so, I'm almost like a 90 year old man in a, in a 30 year old something body, you know, cause I just <laughs> never really watched teen movies or anything. And so I said, no. And I also was 
freaked out that the scoring community had written me off when I was just making a name for myself in the scoring world. That I was then I was just like not one of them anymore because I'm going to direct something that bothered me for some reason. So mm. I, I, you know, scratched my way back into the scoring world and did that as a career for the next, you know, 20 years. And, um, uh, and now I've gotten myself again to a place where, you know, I could potentially knock on wood, direct something. Uh, and, and uh, so who knows, by this point, if I had done Dude, Where's My Car or something like that, I would be directing any, anything I want to direct right now, you know, or it could have failed miserably, uh, you know, but in retrospect, maybe I should have done it anyway, because if it failed, who cares, I could have still gone back to film scoring, so I, sh I should have just done it, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, you never know, I mean, there are um, yeah. so many, so many paths you could take, and um, yeah. I, I actually think that you... Um, you were supposed to, is that true that you were, um, you would have done the first X-Men movie too, uh, if it hadn't yeah. been for Urban Legends too? Yeah, when we tried desperately to, um, literally, uh, Brian offered Phoenix Pictures like a few hundred thousand dollars if they could push their post-production schedule so I could score X Men, um, and um, they're like, uh, "No, we're not going to do that." You know, so, um, and I was kind of, you know, I really wanted to score it, and I'm also, uh, and it's, it's a long story about his nightmare editing that film without me, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was that was uh, I would have been doing that film, of course, you know, and so I had the dubious task of trying to help him find a composer. You know, and here I am, like trying to help him find a guy doing to do the job I really wanted to do, but I didn't. But you know, I, I had no agenda trying to to slip Brian up, and so I really wanted to you know, give him some good ideas. And um, uh, as it turned out, the Donners were very uh, connected to uh, Michael Kamen, and I think Brian is a, was a little bit of a star fucker where he was all excited that Michael Kamen had worked with Eric Clapton and and the Donners, and so he hired hired him and Michael Kamen is a wonderful composer, N nothing against Michael Kamen, but, the, the, but the, the casting of him for the job with Brian was the wrong match. And I, I just, I knew it would be. And I told Brian, I said, look, he works nothing the way I work. It doesn't work any way the way I work. He doesn't do mock-ups. You're not going to hear what you're going to get, you know? And, and, and also the other thing, the major difference was that I, Brian was used to be, to, was used to be to, being told by me what he had to do. I was the one defining, this is what the music should do. This is what we should do here. And Brian would just say, okay, fine. You know, or he would, he would, or, or he would like um, say, I don't like that, but okay, that's good. But he'd let me sort of take the ball and run with it. And Michael Kamen was more of a composer where, what do you want me to do? Tell me. And Brian would be like, you know, I don't know, just make it. And he says, and then, so he just told Michael, um, I want it to be like the 70s because we love films in the 70s, which Brian and I do. We think that's, I think that's a heyday of film making was, for me was the the mid to late 70s you know or early 70s even. and but michael came and took that in a different way than brian and i take that we my sensibility is sort of like i'm ingrained with the storytelling sensibilities of the 70s but doesn't mean i'm literally going to do a score that sounds like it was taken out of one of those movies it'll have that sensibility michael took that direction as like literally a 70s score and so i think his first iterations of the score were you know shock and of course um, he would just get to the, to the scoring stage and kind of wing it, you know, where Brian was like, you know, so I think Brian, there's, there's the stories today still on that Fox stage remain about the, that, that movie and how Brian would run onto the scoring stage going, no, 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 no. You know, it's like Michael came and having like nervous breakdowns and, you know, and I look, I, I, I told him this would happen, you know, and again, nothing against Michael came and just a different kind of, uh, of you know, way of working uh, that he, that I didn't think would ever work for Brian, you know, mm. anyway. But yeah, I mean, but you yeah, were able it, to, to get back into the X-Men world then after all with the sequels, so. <laughs> well, it's funny because, I mean, it, you know, Brian would tell me what a disaster X-Men was going to be, you know, and because on, behind the scenes, it, apparently it was just, a shit show beyond all shit shows but so i was expecting when i saw the film it to be you know just unwatchable it was totally fine you know and so um i they did a good job covering up what the shit show was behind the scene where there was five editors i guess all the all five editors didn't like each other and one threw a bottle through a window when he was talking to brian if you mentioned my name one more time you know because you know he was all john would do this john would do that and, and so by the when i walked into x Men 2 literally the head of the studio was like you're John Hobbit <laughs> because 
because for the whole year or a year and a half of X Men One, Brian would just kind of say, "John would do this, John would do that," and so, um, and, and so there, I could do no wrong, you know. <laughs> that film, you know? So it was, and and they just let me do what I wanted pretty much on that on that movie. So yeah. <laughs> it's good being set up, sort of uh, like as exactly. A it's like it's like when you're hired to rescore a movie, you know, when they when they many times. Um, uh, unfairly have, have have fired the first composer because the film is having problems. They always blame the composer. So when you come on as the guy rescoring the film, you know, you're just like, you know, the, 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 the sea is parting and the angels are singing <laughs> and you're walking in the room, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, you've been on the other side of that too, right? With Halloween, um, age 20. So. Yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, that's another whole podcast in itself, but it's, uh -huh. uh, you know, again, as a filmmaker in retrospect, I understand uh, the producer's mindset where the idea, where what happened was, is uh, uh, speaking of Hitchcockian and all that stuff is uh, the, the director brought me on. He says, I want to have like an Alfred Hitchcock kind of score and do something different. That's not like, you know, typical, you know, horror clunks and bangs. I'm like, okay, cool. So that's what he hired me for. And so I went off and scored the film and the producers, the Weinsteins were completely unaware of this approach. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> they saw it but the problem is they were getting massive high test score ratings with with their temp score which was all screen music and um and uh other remarkable trauma stuff and which is basically in your face kind of approach and and so they were horrified by my more thoughtful score they called it um and where it was more character driven and so it became like a, a cuisinart between my score and and the temp score um it's just, to me, it's just unwatchable. It's just like, uh, you know, you lay out to tell a story with the music and it gets chopped up and, and then suddenly there's a screen cue and then back to your cue and then maybe literally a like screen cue for maybe 15 seconds and back to your cue for a minute, then screen cue for a minute and back to your, you know. But anyway, um, but years later, if I were a producer on that film and I, you know, I've got money behind it and I'm getting massive high test scores with the temp score, uh, I'm going to be a little afraid to, to just completely depart, do an Alfred Hitchcock kind of score, and then release the movie. So I, you know, in retrospect, I understand their their fear in that. You know, mm. I see. I'm not saying uh, I, I like what came from it, but I understand the the producer's mindset. Yeah, you know? mm. yeah. I think actually the the music as it is in the movie is is one of the movie's weakest points um, because it's so yeah. it, it it has nothing to do with the movie in a way. It yeah. feels so generic All over the place. Um, and that. <laughs> sort of yeah um that that harms an otherwise very interesting film but yeah like you said yeah, that's, that's another because podcast because one of my one of my through lines in the movie was not only laurie stroud's theme i came up with but also the isms that john carpenter came up with in his score to, in halloween that that, that little thing mm. that happened, or the or the bum bum Bum. And I had built that in to my score as a, you know, to keep it sort of it's still in line with, with Halloween, but more of a big orchestral version of it, which thank God, at least my opening titles, you know, were intact. And that was sort of the flavor of what the film was going to be, you know, but yeah, I, I could, I couldn't even bring myself to go to the premiere. I just wouldn't, I, I was just so at that time, of course, I was angry and also embarrassed. I, I, I had to put a bag over my head, you know, so, <laughs> or <a> Halloween mask. <laughs> So I think this this covers basically um, what I have about um, okay great urban legends. Um, yeah, it's been so long. I wish I could you know, like come up with some other memories. Um, but there's also that comment or comment track I did years ago. <laughs> there's I guess that stuff was more fresh in my head then, you know. But uh, um, you know, the, but it's funny. This is making me want to go go watch it now. <laughs> so it's, how long has it been since you've seen it? Oh my God. Um, I would say it's got to be at least 10 years since mm -hmm. I've seen it, you know? Um, yeah. One of my regrets is the new director too. And I think this might've been corrected since then is I, you know, you do this, uh, you go in and you do the color timing for the film for the video release. And I was so freaked out back then about people not being able to see detail or something. So I kept having them brighten up every scene mm -hmm. you know and um the poor dp must have been horrified when he saw <laughs> what i had done and, and and i don't know if years since they've you know darkened it to, to look better uh, but i was like 
years later, I was like, why did I do that? It's a horror movie. It should feel a little dark and more contrasty. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, it should be more um, uh, um, David Lynchian, you know, uh, not David Lynchian. Yeah, David Lynch, you know, um, you know, so anyway. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, like I said, it's a, it's a very enjoyable movie. I think it has very a, a lot of very clever moments. Um, yeah, I, I have that... to say, you know, it's funny. I, I'll tell you one little story. When So uh, Brian was busy doing uh, X-Men and he came in to my editing room and, and he watched and I, and I played, a, played a scene for him. I played the scene where the guy's being bludgeoned by the camera lens. And I turned it off and he looked at me and he's so depressed and he says, Oh my God, you're a director. It's like, you're going to be so successful. Meaning that you're, I'm going to lose, I'm, he's going to lose me, right? Yeah. And I said, oh, I, I said, oh, don't worry. I said, this, this is full of great sequences, but when you put it all together, it's fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and that's, it is true. It's like, I'm really proud of a lot of the sequences in that film as, as a director, you know, and how I made them have a flair, like the camera lens scene, you know, giving it more of a, of a style, style. Um, finding that alley and, and how it looks so so creepy and 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 like you said but sort of like uh um modern but 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 creepy looking and and um and uh also like the montage when uh when sandra is is killed you know when it's just the playback of of what her murder was mm-hmm. it's things like that i'm really proud of um and i think those were the moments that the film transcended maybe what it was for a moment um, but again, yeah, you string it all together and you got this goofy horror movie, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess a lot of horror movies are basically like that. And so I'm always just happy to see cool sequences and good ideas and, you know, just to have, um, yeah, yeah. To, to enjoy the ride in a way. Um, right. And, and be interested in, in how it all develops, um, that I don't get the feeling that I've seen um, all of it before. Um, that it keeps right. surprising me, um, and so I see that as a successful movie. Yeah, that was like, it was fun a location scout to find that amusement park because that became you know a more an interesting sequence. And then also, I probably talk about this in my commentary track, but the original the opening of the movie was kind of supposed to be on a boat, which um, all this water comes in and floods the boat. And there's this big giant sequence, and, and it's like I, I, we were already like, how are we going to afford that? And as we're walking through the sound stages, I there was a crack. A door was opened by a crack. I looked through, and there was this jumbo jet set in there and i was like what is that and they said well it's from a movie called pushing tin and i was like we need to make this boat scene on a plane and so that saved a saved us a lot of money and gave us a big production value for the opening of the, of the film even though the opening was supposed to be cheesy and bad because it's a student film a really advanced student film but but it, but it, sometimes i'm like i i i I, I, I cringe hoping the audience is going to get through the scene knowing it's, it's supposed to be terrible. And that's not the way the whole film is going to be that bad. You know? <laughs> so um, it, it was a risky thing because you're really starting your whole film out with like the, this terrible scene, you know, but it was supposed to be, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, but, but the, and when it pulls out in the end and shows the Anson Mount as the director, that, that, that was, that's, that's the fun part of it, you know, mm. um, you know, and this is also pre nine 11. So, you know, pilots being slashed by knives and stuff like that was like, you know, uh, way before that, you know, the terrorists even thought of doing that kind of thing, I guess, you know, so uh, when it showed on TV, a lot of that was cut out, you know, um, so. Mm, I see. Yeah, and yeah. it's the same same year that Final Destination came out, which is also, I mean, it's, it's not a slasher movie, but it has that plane sequence. Um, and so I think, yeah. I, I don't know if your movie was first or if uh, uh, Final Destination was first. Mm, yeah. It kind of feels like it's a riff of uh, that uh, uh, sequence in a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting what, what different countries choose to cut out. I mean, obviously, that's a universal thing, that, that those kind of scenes in a plane during that time. But I remember we did Jack the Giant Slayer, and um, there's a scene where the giants like fi- they fall in this fiery water and uh and we have to uh, uh, recut the film based on whatever cut co- whatever restrictions every country has and in germany you can't have people in fiery water or something like that so we had to at least mm-hmm. that was a decree that was their decree for our film and so we had to really cut back or cut out um the scenes of people in fiery water <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's interesting uh, it's very specific uh thing to cut out you know 
Yeah, I think people on fire, that's always a, a big problem in action movies, for example. Those are the scenes, you know, when you have a stuntman who is on fire. Um, uh -huh. Those are often sequences that get, get cut out of, of German, uh, of the German version of films. So, huh. yeah. And then you, when you look at the UK, for example, you can't have a nunchaku um, in a sequence. They, they always cut <laughs> out scenes with a nunchaku. Um, or they have a problem with a, with uh, if you depict the the syringe um, of the needle going into the vein. Um, so, for example, Pulp Fiction uh, was cut by two seconds because there is this one moment right, where right. Uh, Uma Thurman shoots up, and um, you know they had to sort of reframe that and cut that a little bit just to <laughs> <laughs> have it being shown in England. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always thought if I did a horror film again, because I'm not really a horror film person, but I would just go for the jugular i'd make it the most gory horror because i if i'm gonna go see a horror film i want to see horror you know i want to see mm -hmm. uh, gore um I, you know because that's the fun of it for me and then i thought it got kind of tamed down after the 80s you know and and you know where i remember a halloween 2 where a guy literally sticks his fingers in a guy's eye sockets and pulls and his skull cracks you know those are the kind of things i want to see right and so if I ever did a movie like that, I would just go for it. <laughs> come mm. up with the most nasty, horrible ways of people dying. <laughs> See, that's sort of the advertisement for your next movie when people listen to the podcast and they <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they hear that and they think, yeah, what about Urban Legends Part 4? <laughs> right. Or, or, or the, gore, the gory version of uh, Vivaldi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Huh. Well, it was great going down memory lane. Hope I remembered enough for you. Yes, absolutely, John. Thank you so much for um, sharing your memories and and sure. um, uh, you know diving into the film and, and and all of that. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thanks for doing a show on this uh, little known movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always been or, one of my or, favorites. Or to say, a little you. regarded movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the universally panned or whatever the wikipedia yes. thing is yeah it's always been one of my favorites from the like this this era of horror like the late late 90s early 2000s it's one of the movies that always right. stuck in my head so um uh, it's very enjoyable to uh, go well, beyond the, behind you, the you scenes. actually have really good taste or really bad taste i don't know if i <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we could do it. Uh, I think the jury's still out on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>